Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Yasudian, one of the dermatologists based in the UK. Today I'll be discussing a few ways by which we can measure hair loss in those who present with various scalp conditions. One of the commonest clinical conditions we encounter is hair loss and this used to be called androgenetic alopecia in both men and women. But in my opinion it's too emotive a term for the fairer sex. The word Alopecia is upsetting and the condition has multifactorial etiology, so the term androgenetic is probably not right. There are quite a few signs that can be used to quantitate hair loss. I'll be picking out just four of them as they can be done by doctors and also by the patients themselves. The simplest measure is the width of the central parting when we comb our hair. As we experience more hair loss, then the parting increases in size. Using serial photographs may be a more objective way of monitoring it. Here are a few examples as to how wide the central parting can become with increasing hair loss and reducing density. It's important to remember that a number of otherwise healthy women with or without clinical hair thinning may present with recurrent hair loss. This can reflect seasonality of the growth and shedding of the hair. In this excellent review by Professor Trueb in Switzerland, trichograms in 823 women demonstrated annual fluctuations in the growth and shedding of hair. Hair shedding seemed most prominent in the summer. A second peak also exists, although it's less pronounced, in spring. Shedding was lowest in late winter. Our hair grows through a phase of growing and resting, otherwise called anagen and telogen. Here we can see the fluctuations in telogen or the resting phase in relationship to the day of the year. We clearly observe an increase in summer, resulting in more hair fall and a decrease in winter. Here's an example from the article that shows spontaneous improvement of hair parting without any treatment as the season changes from July to February. I guess this is something to look forward to in the cold, dark winter months as at least our hairs will be getting a bit thicker. To make it more objective, Dr. Sinclair from Australia has proposed this classification where 2 to 3 is classed as moderate severity and 4 to 5 as advanced hair loss. This is called Sinclair's midline hair density scale. Daily scalp hair counts can also be useful for the physician to help quantify how much the patient is losing and to ensure that there is not more than physiological hair loss. There are no precise figures but it's considered normal to lose up to 200 hairs a day. How I completely understand that for someone who has existing hair thinning, this amount may be heartbreaking for them. Patients are instructed to collect hairs shed in one day, count them and place them in plastic bags. All shed hairs in the shower, sink and brush are collected. Daily counts for seven days are maintained. As is to be expected, more hairs are lost during the shampoo days. This is called Sinclair's hair shedding scale. Bundle 1 has 10 hairs, bundle 2 has 50 hairs, bundle 3 has 100 hairs, bundle 4 has 200 hairs, bundle 5 has 400 hairs, and bundle 6 has 750 hairs. On presentation, women are asked how much of hair they shed every day. For women who wash their hair less frequently than every day, they are asked about wash days and non-wash days. Here, 1 to 4 are regarded as normal levels of shedding, and 5 to 6 may be considered excessive shedding. Next is the wash test. The patient does not shampoo the scalp for 5 days, and then he or she shampoos and rinses the hair in the basin with the hole covered by a gauze or cotton clothing. The hairs remaining in the water and in the gauze are collected and sent for examination. Hairs must be counted and divided into less than 3 centimeters, or more than 5 cm in length. This is an important technique to differentiate telogen effluvium, which is associated with stress, from female pattern hair thinning. If less than 100 hairs are lost and more than 10% are less than 3 cm, it is female pattern hair thinning. If more than 100 to 200 hairs are lost, it is more likely to be telogen effluvium. Next is the 60 second hair count. This technique consists of four steps. Before shampooing, comb the hair for 60 seconds over a pillow or a sheet of contrasting color to your hair. Start combing from the back or top to the scalp and move it towards the front of the scalp. 
Repeat the procedure before three consecutive shampooings and always use the same comb or brush. Count the number of hairs in the comb or brush and on the pillow after each hair count and record. Repeat the above procedure monthly and bring the results to your dermatologist. Here's an example from my colleague, Dr. Murugasundaram's patient. There are drawbacks to all these techniques. The methods used can be subjective as the number of hairs lost can vary for each patient. So losing even 50 hairs for a patient with pre-existing hair density may be devastating. Another factor is that the very fine vellus hairs that are shed may not be accounted for. Also, not shampooing for five days may be difficult for some. Finally, falsely high numbers of shed hairs can be due to hair breakage due to combing. So what did I learn from this uh, review? Firstly, we can establish an element of objectivity in a given person by using the numbers of hair lost. It also empowers the patients as they are able to keep track of their scalp condition. For both clinicians and patients, it's useful to monitor response. However, remember that there are drawbacks. We need to be pragmatic in interpreting the results. I hope you found this information useful. Thank you for your attention. Bye.